guys. Um, I'm Kelly, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet. And I'm really glad to be with y'all tonight, even if it is through a screen. Um, I'm glad that we haven't given up meeting with one another and encouraging one another in our connect groups. Um, yeah. So if you've been with us, then you know that we are going through a series called A Season in the Minors, and we're looking at a few of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. We looked at Habakkuk, Amos, and Haggai. And this week, I have the pri privilege of uh, talking about Hosea. Um, I love the book of, the book of Hosea uh, because there's so much imagery in it, which I love as a self-proclaimed picture book person, um, if you're like me. And also because it so evidently points to Jesus, who comes like some 700 years later. And we'll talk more about this in a bit. Um, our bottom line, our main idea for the night is we are consistently unfaithful, but God is persistently faithful to us. And that goes hand in hand with our, our key verse for tonight, which is Hosea chapter 14, verses 4, which says, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. Um, and as we've done with each minor prophet before beforehand, uh, we will look at Hosea by answering three different questions. The first, what does Hosea say and why does he say it? Uh, second, how does Hosea, Hosea, not Hosea, how does Hosea point to Jesus? And the third, um, how do we apply the words of Hosea to our own lives? Um, to give some background on Hosea before, before diving in, um, the book of Hosea was written in 750 BC, um, aka a long time ago, um, and also uh, 700 years, as I said before, 700 years before Jesus was born. Um, and he's speaking mainly to the northern kingdom of Israel after they've split from the southern kingdom, which is known as Judah. And we've talked about this split uh, some, and you can read more about how it all goes down in, in First and Second Kings. But essentially, the northern kingdom, so they're referred to as Israel, they're also referred to as Ephraim or Jacob. And you'll see those names interchangeably throughout Hosea. So they... Um, have decided to split off and, and do their own thing from the southern kingdom. And they even built a second temple, uh, which, long story short, goes terribly. Um, and so it's important to know that Hosea is speaking to a group of historically rebellious people, right? And so, okay, the first question, what does Hosea say? What does he actually say? And why does he say it? Um, and so Hosea is made up of 14 chapters total, and a few, diff few different sources actually said that Hosea was intended to be broken up into three different sections. So we have Hosea 1 through 3, um, Hosea 4 through 11, and then Hosea 12 through 14. And I actually found that like really helpful, those different sections uh, when studying the book of Hosea, and so that's kind of how we'll break it down as well uh, tonight. And something cool that I, that I found when I was rereading Hosea was that God uh, gives Hosea a picture, he uses imagery um, to help explain what the message is that he's bringing um, in each of these three sections. So there's a, a picture example in each of these sections. Uh, the first, there's a marriage. Um, a second, a father's relationship to his son. And then the third example is of a fruitful and like flourishing tree. Um, okay, so in the first few chapters of Hosea, chapters 1 through 3, um, it's mostly about God telling Hosea, a prophet, um, that he is to go and marry this woman named Gomer. And so at first you're like, oh, sweet, like, it's a love story. Uh, um, but, like, not exactly, because God tells Hosea that Gomer will pursue other lovers uh, throughout their marriage, um, and that he, Hosea, is to remain faithful to Gomer, even though she's committing adultery. And not just remain faithful, but to actually like go after her, pay off her debts that she owes these men that she's been sleeping with, and to actually bring her home with him. Um, tough, right? Uh, so why does God tell Hosea to do such a hard thing? Um, God tells Hosea in chapter 3, Verse 1, that the Israelites are represented by Gomer um, because they continue to rebel against their God 
and instead go after idols that fail to give them what they really desire. Um, But God remains to them as a faithful husband. And this message kind of continues on in the second section, which is chapters 4 through 11, um, by Hosea calling out um, the Israelites for their hypocrisy. Um, So the Israelites here are going to the temple and they're performing all the like religious duties uh, while all this injustice is going on around them. And and while on the side they're worshiping this other God named Baal. Um, And so Hosea tells them these things in an effort to warn them against trusting in other gods and other political leaders uh, for protection. Right? If you know anything about the Israelites and their history, um, they do that quite a bit, and it, every time it fails them. Right? And Hosea here is saying that it will continue to fail them. And he specifically warns them against the coming Assyrians. Um, he tells them these things also because his desire is for them to know God personally. Um, we'll talk more about that to know phrase uh, a little bit later on. Um, But this message is made really clear in the next picture that Hosea gives us in in chapter 11. And that is a picture of God as a faithful, or excuse me, as a a loving father um, to his rebellious son, Israel. Um, Okay, so let's let's read it here. It's in Hosea chapter 11. I'm going to give you a second to grab your Bible and open it. Take a swig of water while I wait. Are we there? Maybe some of you, if you're lucky. Um, If not, just go back and read it. Follow along with me. I'll read it. Um, Okay, so it's titled, The Lord's Love for Israel. Um, And this this is God speaking. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. And kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim, uh, which is Israel, to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with bands of love. And I became to them as the one who eases the yoke on their jaws. And I bent down to them and I fed them. And then we'll skip down to verse 7 where it says, My people are bent on turning away from me. And then they call out to the Most High, He shall not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you, make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeoboam? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Um, So his anger, God turns his anger into compassion, right? And I, I encourage you to go and read this, this passage, Hosea 11, it's one of my favorites. It's, it's really beautiful. Um, and so moving on, in, in the last few chapters, in the last section of Hosea, um, Hosea brings up some of the things, some of the past times um, when the Israelites were forgetful or unfaithful to God. Um, specifically, he brings up Jacob's story in Genesis, and then when the Israelites rebel against or are unfaith- or unfaithful towards God um, in the wilderness even though he just brought them out um, of slavery in Egypt. Um, And then he again warns them against trusting in the Assyrians, Uh, even though we know through history that like 30 years later, they will indeed trust the Assyrians. um, And and plot twist, it doesn't work out as expected. Um, It fails them. The Assyrians fail them. Uh, But here, Hosea is warning them against that and instead calls them to repent of their sin and return to the God, return to their God. And then Hosea ends the book um, with yet another picture that represents God's promise to be faithful, to restore, and to lovingly redeem his people. Um, And this time it's through a tree, Um, a tree that will be strong and planted under the protection of God's shadow, producing fruit and, and acting as a blessing to everyone around it. And you'll notice in Hosea chapter 14 that he uses future language, uh, like I will and we will, uh, which means that God is promising a future redemption and healing for his people. Um, And this leads us to our next question, which is, how does Hosea point to Jesus? Um, And if there were two words um, to sum up Hosea, and like really the whole Bible, I think they would be, but God. Um, Right over and over again in Hosea, 
uh, he reminds us of Israel's inability to get it right, right? Like one minute, they promise to be faithful to God. And the very next minute, they're living totally opposite from how God has called them to live. Um, we, you and I, me especially, are just like the Israelites. Um, but God promises to be faithful, to go after his children, um, and, to, and to bring them back to himself. And he does this mainly through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Um, and just as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, um, he says, But God... Being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. It is by grace you have been saved. And so there's that. And then even in those three pictures that I keep mentioning, right? Again, I love a picture. Um, even in those three forms of imagery, um, the Hosea's marriage to the adulterous Gomer in chapters 1 through 3, God has a loving father to the rebellious son, Israel, in chapter 11, and that flourishing, fruitful tree in the last chapter. Even those um, so evidently point to Jesus, right? It's um, Jesus that is described as a faithful husband in the New Testament, loving and giving himself up for um, his bride, the church. Uh, Jesus responds to the Pharisees' criticism of him eating with sinners, by telling the story of the prodigal son, um, a story that looks a lot like the one we see in Hosea chapter 11, right? Of a faithful father, not only forgiving, but running after his lost and rebellious child um, to bring him home. And finally, in John chapter 15, Jesus commands his disciples to abide in him, um, that he is the vine, the source of life, and we are the branches. Um, that we can only produce fruit and stay connected to God by putting our hope um, by putting our hope and abiding in Jesus. Uh, there again is this picture of a fruitful tree. Um, okay, so how do we take these words? How do we apply these words from Hosea uh, to our lives today? As, as Christians living in 2020 during the coronavirus, um, how do we take his words to heart? How do y'all as middle school and high school students? Um, I think one of the ways can be found in that word, that phrase to know that I mentioned earlier. Um, we see it all throughout the book of Hosea. And most notably in Hosea chapter 6, verses 6, when God says, um, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. The knowledge, there's the word, of God rather than burnt offerings. Um, and so the Hebrew word that's used for knowledge here is pronounced yada, which I think is fun to say. Um, and the Bible Project, which is like an awesome resource when if you're studying something in the Bible and, and you need maybe some help in understanding it, I would suggest the Bible, the Bible Project, this website podcast. This is not an advertisement, whatever, but it's awesome. Um, they define yada as um, the difference between knowing about someone and actually knowing that person. God wants Israel to know him in a committed relationship and to experience his love for them. That's the kind of knowledge that transforms people's hearts and lives. Um, okay, so how do we know God in this way? Um, we spend time with him, right? We talk to him. We ask him questions. We tell him what's going on in our lives. We uh, read the Bible and know what he says, what his word says. Um, we also do it by talking to other people about God, by asking them questions about him. Um, I got to know my, my now husband, Andy, of course, through like spending time with him and asking him questions personally, but also by asking his friends and family uh, questions about him, right? What do they know about Andy that I didn't already know? Um, and we do the same thing in Christian community, right? Are you curious about something that you read in the Bible? Are you confused about something you read in the Bible? Uh, same, right? I'm sure a lot of your leaders would say the same thing. Um, let's talk about it together. I need to talk to y'all about stuff that I'm confused about. Um, talk to your friends. Talk to your parents about it. Um, I've honestly found that during this strange time, people having to isolate and stay home um, or distanced and stay home and, and be away from those people, uh, that they're really more interested in, in having meaningful conversations, that we're really hungry for relationship. And so I challenge you to engage in one of those meaningful conversations about God this week. Uh, maybe that's with a friend or with your family. Um, that can be over Zoom or over text or Instagram DMs or like over the family table. Um, but I challenge you to do that. And the best part about yada, this concept of yada is that God knows you and he knows me like that. 
personally um, and relationally. And his desire is for us to know him in that way too. Um, and so we, like the Israelites that Hosea speaks to, are consistently unfaithful to God. Uh, but God is persistently faithful to his people. Um, and he brings us redemption through Jesus. And we, through Jesus, can know God personally instead of pretending or performing for him. Let's pray. God, thank you that all the fitness that you require, um, Lord, all the work you require from us is to feel our need for you. Um, and even that, even that feeling, that need you give us, um, God, that we so obviously cannot clean ourselves up or, or fix ourselves out of our sin or pretend it's not there. Um, we see that, we're reminded of that in, in the book of Hosea. Um, and most notably in, in, in Jesus and his life, death, and resurrection. Um, Lord, thank you that Jesus was and is a friend to sinners, a friend of sinners, um, and that he was not afraid to associate with them. Lord, I pray that we would first know that for ourselves and then know that for the people around us, that we too would not be afraid to associate with, with quote-unquote sinners. Lord, because we would know that um, first and foremost, we are the chief of sinners, that we, we need you the most. Um, thank you that you bend down to us and to feed us. Um, and that you lead us with cords of kindness and with bands of love, and that your your stance towards us cannot change because it is set in Christ. Um, I pray for my friends in Connect Group and that their conversation would be honest and that they would um, spend this week in Hosea with us, um, that we would, we would hear from you, God, and we would sit and, and abide in you and be with you. Um, thank you for Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Thanks for listening, guys. Um, I hope you have an awesome connect group.